Welcome to Vintage Hollywood Archive. Hollywood film noir history would not be complete without a careful mention of Jane Greer. She is one lady with special talent and beauty that almost equal her with legendary beauties like Elizabeth Taylor and Ava Gardner of the era, cute, skillful, with personal vibes that seem to light up the screen once she's on sight. I still remember her shine as a romantic image, but I'm not sure I understand what happened to her glamorous career. Make sure to watch the video until the end, and if you're new here, don't forget to join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Vintage Hollywood Archive channel. Jane Greer is a classic lady whose sincere beauty may not have equaled her performance in Hollywood. You can call her queen of film noir for an obvious reason, but was her career as progressive as one had expected? What ensued in the life of this fussy lady? Jane Greer was one of the reigning Hollywood movie sensations in the late 1940s. Like most legendary beauties, she also had a few powerful men in her career life, especially one who moved from a professional partner to a romantic lover. Jane Greer began a love life with matinee icon Rudy Valley. She was also largely associated with Howard Hughes, who was not just a lover but also a mentor and teacher, and she was willing to grow under his tutelage until things turned sour for her. Sadly, she is no longer with us, and all her glamour and vibrancy may have become history. Her fans will not forget the hurry the circumstances that characterized her partnership with Hughes and the part it played in her career. Best remembered today for that startling role she played in the RKO picture in the 1947 Out of the Past production that saw her co-starring Robert Mitchum. This talented American film and television actress was awesome in that femme fatale role, appearing as Kathy Moffat, and won herself a place in history, the reason some of us would not let her legacy die so soon. When the movie was released that year, out of the past, and was a judged success, its audience became more interested in its leading lady, Jane Greer, who already made an appearance on the front cover of Life magazine as a model, was no doubt a gem at the time as her creativity cemented her status as the queen that everyone was after. During this period also, time adjudged her number six among Hollywood's most promising actresses, behind Ava Gardner and Elizabeth Taylor. Critics thought that Greer and Mitchum made a good on-screen pair. The reason the producer decided to pair them again two years after in The Big Steal and after that, everyone kept talking about them as an ideal screen couple. Some talk about them as among the best film noir screen couple. In case you don't know much about Jane Greer, she was an attractive young lady at the time, intelligent and seriously gifted. Almost everyone believes that Jane Greer had all it takes to go further and become an international superstar like her counterpart, but that was not the case. Lots of fans miss her so much because of the way she faltered from big pictures that they thought she should have anchored. I, too, couldn't find her name anywhere. Jane Greer suddenly went into oblivion. It seemed her career crashed and burned in just a few years of showtime. And just before we forget this unique lady or have her career exploit fade from our consciousness, it is good we know a little about things that defined her brief stardom in Hollywood. Although not much was said or heard, fans were saddened when they learned that Jane Greer was no more. She was said to have died of complications from cancer at her Los Angeles home. That unfortunate incident was two weeks before her 77th birthday. Jane Greer was born Betty Jane Greer in Washington, D.C. in 1924 to Charles Greer Jr. and his wife Betty. Sometime in 1940, when Greer was just 15, she had a condition known today as facial palsy, which weakened the left corner of her face. A story was told of how Jane Greer was at a party with a friend, cooling off when she was asked by her companion why she was exhibiting such a hilarious face. Confused, she quickly ran to a mirror and was shocked to see how the muscles on the left corner of her face had sagged. A medical examination later confirmed she had facial paralysis known as Bell's Palsy. Young, beautiful, and very hopeful Jane Greer, who aspired to go far with her entertainment dream, was quick to visit places to search for a solution to her problem, but was told by doctors that the condition was likely irreversible. She was also given a hint on how she could manage it, 
This included regularly closing her eye with her left hand each time she went to bed and frequently shoving the left corner of her mouth upward to form a frozen smile before heading to school. As funny, hard, and inconveniencing as this may sound, Jane Greer took the challenge and religiously carried out the instructions, which she later described as exercises. She did a series of it daily and painstakingly maintained the muscle tone and stimulated her facial nerve. And like magic, she was able to nearly gain control of her original face. On how she accomplished that, Jane Greer said that the experience alone helped her become an actress. She has always wanted to be a movie character and suddenly started learning to take charge of her facial muscles. This, she said, was one of the best assets she had as a performer. Because it made her understand the benefit of facial expression in communicating with human emotion. Although she got over it, the disorder did give her a special appearance different from what her face would have been. Jane was described as having a calm, quizzical gaze and an enigmatic expression, which made RKO talent publicity marketer promote her as the woman with the Mona Lisa smile. Jane Greer began her career as a professional teenage model and was said to have once won a beauty contest and was naturally attracted to showbiz, where she started as a big band singer. She performed in Washington, D.C. with Heinrich Mandragira's orchestra and was reported to have sung phonetically in Spanish. She was into full entertainment activity before that unconventional billionaire and film producer Howard Hughes spotted her as a model and encouraged her to come to Hollywood for an acting job. I can understand why Howard got interested in Jane Greer and decided to bring her in. She was beautifully peculiar. By 1945, while she was still living with her parents and running her stint from home, Howard contacted her and the two got connected. It seems he got smitten by the young beauty and decided to bring her closer to himself. Jane Greer revealed how they became friends and would regularly relax at the Chi Chi Bar on Hollywood Boulevard, where they'd normally eat the same type of meal each time they came. The meal she described as hamburgers, peas, mashed potatoes, salad, and a chocolate sundae. He would call her at odd hours of the night and ask her for a dinner night out. She recalled telling him once, Howard, I've gone to bed, and listening to him beg, it's not that far, please don't let me eat alone. To which she got off, dressed, and joined him. Howard spent a lot of time chatting and possibly toasting the fresh beauty that she talked of him as one who loved to talk on the phone. On a particular day at the Chichi venue, they were together when Howard got up and said, I'm not going to make any phone calls, that he was going to the men's room. Minutes later, he came back and she threw a question at him. You made some phone calls, didn't you? I didn't, was his response while his shirt was drenched. An inquisitive Jane Greer asked to know what happened to his shirt. I just washed it, he responded. He took it off and washed it because there was some chocolate sauce on it, he hinted. That was the first time Jane Greer observed the washing syndrome. She had heard about Howard's compulsive washing of hands before then, and that incident confirmed what she had heard. I found him rather endearing, like a child, she said, referring to how Howard treated her. He liked to go to the amusement park, where she said he won a huge collection of QB dolls for her. During this time, Greer took the name Jane Greer as her legal name from the initial Betty Jane Greer, confirmed by a Los Angeles court. Talking about the name change, she said the former was a sissy name that is too Bo Peepish, ingenuineish for her roles. Being a businessman, Hughes put her on an exclusive contract. With that agreement, she would not do any movie screen tests or get involved in any movie without him. It appeared like an express and strict instruction not to mingle with anyone. At some point, she got irritated about the contract, her relationship with him, and anything that had to do with him, and sought to gain her freedom because Howard wanted to own everything about her, but it didn't go down well with her. It was not clear how that one panned out, but some reporters say Howard lent her to RKO, where she starred in many films. Another source said she disputed her contract with him and had to pay for the breach of contract with the help of her husband to end the contract and properly joined RKO. As soon as she married Edward Lasker, her relationship with Howard was badly severed as it was reported that her husband helped her enter a different contract with RKO, which excluded Howard. But the trouble with Hughes was yet from being over. By the time she finished making Out of the Past, billionaire Howard Hughes had bought over RKO Studio. 
and she was back again under his influence since she was still on contract with the studio. He invited her to his office, located at the Goldwyn Studios, where he was operating, as he never used the RKO lot, and said to her, I know you're not happy. I can imagine what her reaction was. Greer said she countered the statement by saying to him, I am happy, I have a baby now, I hope to have more. Howard knew exactly where he was heading when he asked about her relationship with her husband. You're not happy with Edward Lasker, to which she responded that she is happy with him. And of course, the feud between Howard and the couple was obvious, and Jane Greer knew Howard hated her husband, possibly for coming in between her relationship with him. It was also obvious that Greer and her husband detested his countenance at the time, and she was expecting more trouble from Howard, but was not sure the angle the stress would come from. Before she left his office that day, Howard assured her that as long as he owned the studio, she won't work. This will kill my career, she had protested, but a more determined Howard affirmed her fears by saying, yes, it will. And from that moment, things went sour for her. But luckily for her, during the time for the Big Steel movie, Robert Mitchum got arrested for having marijuana while his leading lady, Elizabeth Scott, was already in her costume. As soon as she learned that he would be jailed for that, Elizabeth declined to work with him. So, Howard started looking for her replacement to work with Mitchum because the work needed to start in a few days in Mexico. Several people turned down a request to play the leading lady role. Itching to go back to screen, Jane Greer said she wanted to play the role because she didn't want Mitchum to be upset by all the rejections. Perhaps with no better choice on his side, the studio head Sid Regal told Greer that Howard would contact her and that he would want to trap you and urged her to be careful. And when her phone rang, Howard, who still addressed her by her original name, Betty Jane, asked if she was interested in doing the movie with Mitchum. I'd love to, Howard. I worked with him. I'd love to work with him again, was her response. That was it, but he insisted she wears Elizabeth Scott's costume. After a little argument about her pregnancy that needed about three months or so to be visible, she got the role. During the filming, she realized that the costumes they had made were tough, a tight short skirt, a burello, and the likes, and no big hats, nor anything to hide behind. While she was still managing that, Midgem was sentenced to 60 days in prison, and by the time they resumed filming, her pregnancy got very tight squeezes. After that picture, she resumed her performance, but the hatred never really disappeared. After appearing in a few more movies including You're in the Navy Now, The Prisoner of Zenda, and Run for the Sun, all of which did not quite make it big in the successful movie arena, Greer began to have second thoughts. It was not until she did Against All Odds, a recreation of Out of the Past, as the mother of the character she had portrayed in the earlier version, that she tendered her resignation and eased herself off her contract with MGM Studios. She later told fans that she left because they don't want another actress to achieve stardom. After all, every good role at MGM was either given to Lana or Ava. It is for the same reason that analysts describe her as one of the best actors that were never nominated for an Academy Award. Quite a sad tale for this beautiful and intelligent actress. Jane Greer's presence was also felt on television, appearing as a guest on episodes of serial TV shows, Alfred Hitchcock Presents, Bonanza, and Quincy readily come to mind. Her earliest marriage with Rudy Valley, which began in 1943, had issues that caused their separation three months after and divorced him in 1944. Her union with Edward Lasker, with whom she had three sons, ended in divorce in 1967. It was actor Frank London who became Jane Greer's partner until his death, six months before Greer kicked the dust. A lifelong Democrat and a Catholic faithful, Jane Greer joined her ancestors in 2001 at the age of 76. Howard Hughes was determined to control Jane Greer's private life. This was the life of Hollywood. How was Tippi Hedren forced to do brutal and ugly things? Check this out. <laughs>